do we need direct core training for athletes? You go sprint, you jump, you run, your core is being maximally trained during those movements. How do we age gracefully and maintain our athleticism for as long as possible? A um, lot of area, different areas that we could go with this. First and foremost, you're listening to the PJF Podcast, a show dedicated to decoding elite sports performance and fitness. I'm Paul Fabritz, and I'm an MBA strength and conditioning and performance trainer. If you want to become superhuman, take your fitness and take your sports performance to the next level, this is the podcast for you. Let's do it. What's up, my squids? Welcome back to the podcast. This is the Dikembe Mutombo episode, episode number 55. This is the Jason Williams episode, episode number 55. I didn't know who to use because they're pretty similar. Are they pretty similar legacy-wise, Jason Williams and Dikembe Mutombo? I would say they're pretty similar. Dikembe maybe had a more successful career statistically, but Jason Williams is a legend. That dude is so freaking good, so skilled. So we're going to call this the Jason Williams episode. All right, we're going to do a Q&A. I got some really good stuff for you guys today. I just chose questions that I feel like I haven't answered on this podcast. Uh, you guys probably know what I've said on this podcast better than I know. A lot of times I forget the topics that I've already covered because I've talked about so many things. So if, if I ever repeat myself, I'm sorry, but... Um, it is what it is. So first question that I took from Instagram is, do we need direct core training for athletes? So direct core training, you know, planks or sit-ups or cable rotational chops, um, this kind of stuff, as opposed to uh, just global core training, like, like full body training, which involves your core, right? Because there's basically two schools of thought. One school of thought, and this is the most popular, especially with athletes, your core is already being trained, right? You go sprint, you jump, you run, your core is being maximally trained during those movements. You squat, you do a compound lift, you do an overhead press. All of those things are training your core. Um, so you don't need direct core training. The other school of thought is... Uh, you're not actually overloading your core. Yes, your core is involved in those movements, but you're not overloading them. Your core is never the limiting factor in those movements. Like, you know, people say, well, if you do a standing one arm overhead press, feel your core, it's engaged, right? And it's like, yeah, it is engaged, but it's not the limiting factor. Like, I'm not going to come to failure with that dumbbell because my oblique gave out. I'm going to come to failure because my shoulder gave out. So if I, if, if, if that oblique is not the limiting factor of the exercise, I'm not truly overloading the oblique, but I could truly overload the oblique with a with direct core training, like a heavy side plank or uh, cable rotation or something like that. So those are kind of the uh, the the schools of thought. There's there's another school of thought. Number three is that. Core training is not only a waste of time, it's actually detrimental um, because it makes you lose, I guess, rotation. It, if you're doing like anti-rotational work, right? A plank, a side plank, any isometrics, um, you know, a, a pal-off press. Some people will say that that actually ruins your rotation and it makes you stiff. And the old school thought of is like, like when you're running, you want to stay you know, level and the shoulders don't dip and the hips don't dip. And we know that that's crazy. Uh, obviously, rotation is going to drive movement. So we want to be able to rotate, right? Watch Usain Bolt sprint. There's a lot of rotation going on there. And in the, in the old school, like I remember the commentator, um, I think it was Michael Johnson, actually, who was also a legendary sprinter, but he was, a, he was commentating on Usain Bolt's running for him. And he was like, yeah, there's, there's so many inefficiencies. Like he rotates too much. You see the shoulders dropping. He didn't realize like that's actually Usain Bolt's superpower, right? If you took away that, the, the shoulders dropping and the rotation, um, then he would not have all of the records. Um, and so rotation is a huge part of athletic movement. So then people say, well, if you do an anti-rotational hold, like a pal-off press, you're going to ruin your ability to rotate. Okay, so those are the three schools of thought. Um, 
it's important to, to understand the arguments of each side. Um, and the answer for me is every side has a, a point, every side is right, and every side is wrong. And context matters, right? So yes, the core is probably not being fully overloaded just through your compound lifts. Um, like I said, if you're doing that overhead press, you, your core is never what gives out. Um, if you're doing a back squat, maybe your lower back gives out and, and yeah, that's your core, but like, are your front abs giving out before your legs? Doubt it. Um, are your obliques giving out before your legs? I doubt it. Uh, sprinting is, is, is the core, the limiting factor. Do you come to failure because the core is just so tired. No. And so if you want to strengthen those muscles, then at some point, some direct core training where the, those core muscles are the limiting factor is probably a pretty good idea. Now, will this make you more athletic? Will, will side planks and front planks and, you know, V-ups and sit-ups, are they going to make you more athletic? I don't think so. I don't think that's how it works. Um, I don't think there's a huge benefit athletically, uh, but I think if you want to do it and you want to have a more ripped six pack, then yeah, I think you can do it. Um, obviously what matters for a ripped six pack first and foremost is going to be your diet. Um, you, you have to be low body fat to see the abs, right? But at the same time, you can make those abs pop. You can make those obliques pop. Uh, just like any other muscle, they will grow. Um, so that does matter, right? As athletes, some, some athletes just want to look good. They want to go out on the beach. They're like they got endorsements too. They're trying to make money. Like this is all a business. So yeah, looking good actually matters. I'm fine with that thought. I, I'm fine with that thought process. If an athlete's like, yeah, like let's do all this stuff. That's going to make me better, but also I'm going to be sleeveless year round. So like, let me hit some bicep curls here and there. Let me like, I'm, I'm going to be out on the beach. So like, let me get, let me get a rip six pack. I get that. And yes, with direct core training, that is going to be the best way to get your abs and your obliques to pop. They don't grow as much as like your quads or your glutes, uh, but you absolutely can um, grow your ab muscles. So that is where direct core training comes into play. Uh, I think eventually you do have to just move over to more athletic stuff like med ball throws, right? Um, um, like, like lateral med ball throws and multi-directional throws. Like these things are really, really training your core very well, but they're involving your hips. There's force from the ground up. Um, this is what we could consider integrating the fascia as people like to say these days, uh, because um, you know, you're transferring energy from one area to another and the core is kind of the force transmitter. You're, you're transmitting force between the lower body and the upper body and vice versa between the upper body and the lower body. Um, and so that's where I think you can improve some athleticism is when you get into more of the ballistic, uh, rapid core training. Um, but I am totally fine with the, with the direct core training, if that is what somebody wants to do. Now, the other benefit to some direct core training and specifically like isometric holds, right? That's what people are moving away from um, is like anti-extension matters. Anti-rotation does matter because the people who knock like anti-rotation or anti-extension, they're looking at it from a sprint performance standpoint. But a basketball player, a football player, shoot, maybe even a soccer player, there's contact involved. And so if I'm in the post and I'm getting hit, somebody is hitting me in the chest, I need anti-extension strength. I don't want to fly into lumbar hyperextension, right? Because then I'm out of position. I'm out of the play. And so a lot of that is lower body. Some of that's going to be upper body, but a lot of that is going to be core, right? And so uh, if I'm driving to the basket and I get hit in one shoulder, do I fly into rotation or do I have that anti-rotational strength to just stay on my path, stay on my line? Like Steph Curry has talked about that being one of the huge separators in his career is his work in the weight room that has helped him be able to stay on path, to not be knocked out of his postures, to not be knocked off his path. Um, so I think it is really, really important, like your ability 
to defensively wall up, I do think you need some anti-extension core strength. And so like a heavy, uh, like a weighted plank is a good thing to do there. A, a, a barbell rollout is a good thing to do there. Um, I'm cool with like some anti-rotation stuff, some pal-off presses. Um, it, it's just important that, that you understand like you're not doing a pal-off press so that when you go sprint, you limit rotation. That was like the initial mechanism is like, oh, people are over rotating when they sprint. So do this pal off press to get more stiff and to get more rigid and, and keep everything more stable. That's the wrong mechanism. But then once you attack that mechanism and you go, that's the wrong mechanism, you throw the baby out with the bathwater. You, you, you don't have to throw out the exercise completely because there's other mechanisms that actually make sense. Like, yeah, I, I get hit in one shoulder. I don't want to fly into rotation. So having the ability to have really good anti-rotational strength doesn't take away from your ability to rotate. The only way that that is the case is if you like completely stopped running and doing anything athletic and you stopped rotating and you stopped throwing med balls and all you did for like hours in the gym was like hold an anti-rotational press. But like four sets, uh, Three sets of eight anti-rotational press is going to completely somehow neurologically just ruin you? No, that's not enough of a stimulus compared to you going out and running and throwing med balls and doing rotational stuff. So there is a scenario where you get a little bit of, of the best of both worlds. You still have the ability to rotate, but you also have the ability to decelerate rotation or, or to resist rotation when needed. So Overall, wrapping up that question, I would say that I do much less direct core training than I once did. Uh, at one point, it was like a huge thing for me, like three days a week. We need like 30 minutes of core. I don't think we need that. Um, I think that you can do, uh, you could throw in a set at the beginning, you know, at the end of your warm up, even sometimes you throw in one set, it increases your core temperature. It, it's actually really good to get you sweating. Um, is just some core work. So I actually like it in a warm up, um, or maybe as a, a burnout, a finisher, like guys like to leave the gym feeling like, okay, I worked my abs, right? There's just a, there's something to, uh, just feeling that burn, um, in your core. So I just wouldn't waste too much time here. I think, uh, one exercise, a couple sets at the beginning of each workout, maybe three days a week. I think that's going to be plenty for you. Um, so as always on this podcast, it goes back to context. All right. The next question is about athletic aging. So how do we age gracefully and maintain our athleticism for as long as possible? A um, lot of area, different areas that we could go with this. First and foremost, you build your athletic peak as high as you possibly can. The guys who you think have aged the most gracefully, LeBron James, for sure, probably the best of all time, you know, 39 and he's still in MVP contention. Um, Vince Carter aged really well athletically. Russell Westbrook, I think he's 35 now. He's aged really well athletically. Um, they've all lost a step. Like, let's not get that twisted. They've all lost a step. They've all lost several inches on their vertical jump. But their athletic peak was so high. In your early 30s, you're going to drop one level. And so... For them, they went from absolute freak athletes, top 99th percentile. They went from freak athlete to elite athlete, you know, and then in the late 30s, they'll go from elite athlete to great athlete. And then in their early 40s, they'll go from great athlete to good athlete. And then eventually they'll become average athletes. But uh, in your early 30s, everybody is typically going to drop. Sometimes it happens way earlier. Sometimes it's twenties because injuries, um, injuries, poor training, poor lifestyle. Like there's a lot of reasons why it could happen earlier in your twenties. But I would say if you do everything perfect, then in your thirties, and it's not always 30, it's not always 31, but like 32, 33, 34 is where we typically start to see a drop off, especially in terms of jumping. Um, happened to LeBron, happened to Jordan. Jordan lost quite a bit um, in his early 30s. But again, they went from freak athlete to still great athlete or from freak to elite. 
Um, if you, if your athletic peak is average, you're in the 50th percentile. Like you're just fast enough to get blow bys and you jump just high enough to dunk the basketball. Then in your early thirties, when you get that inevitable drop off, now you're below average. So now you can no longer do the things you used to do. You can no longer get in the lane. You can no longer dunk. And so then you have to, the only way you survive at that point is you completely adjust your game. You completely adapt your game and add different things, which is the typical progression for most athletes. However, you know, one consideration is just build as much athleticism as you possibly can in your teens and in your early twenties, because the higher that peak, the more gradual, uh, that ball starts rolling downhill. Um, and that goes, this goes for for longevity training too. And we're talking about, I want to be as healthy as possible at age 80. I want to be healthy and moving well at age 90. Build athleticism at age 20 because it's going to go downhill. But if you're starting all the way up here, it's such a gradual decline. And this has been shown in studies, especially with like bone mass, like while our bones are really, really adaptable and we can make changes probably throughout life, like later in life. Um, but when they're really, really adaptable, it's like your 20s. And so the bone mass that I develop at age 20 is I, I'm going to be holding on to that. I'm going to be trying to hold on to as much as I can of that when I'm 50, 60, 70. Um, and so a lot of people go into their longevity training too early. They're like, hey, I just want to move well when I'm older and uh, I just don't, I just don't want any knee pain. So they're like 20 years old and they're doing like body weight RDLs and they don't like they don't run and jump and they don't lift and they don't do anything that actually would be high enough force on their body, high enough stress on their body to create athletic adaptations. And they, they go into that that conservative mode. They go into that longevity training too early. And then the truth is it doesn't prepare you for anything in the short term because you're not exposing your body to any high forces. Um, but you're really messing yourself up for the long term because you're not building a, a reserve. You're not building um, elite capacity. And while we're the most adaptable, that should actually be the focus. If I want to be athletic at 40, get as athletic as I possibly can at age 20. Um, and that gradual decline is going to look much better, just like it did for Vince, just like it did for Jordan, just like it's looking for LeBron. Um, so that is a huge part of it, right? You know, don't go into longevity mode too early. Um, like, yeah, we want to keep longevity in mind. So don't do like really stupid stuff in your training. Uh, but longevity is not avoiding stress. Like longevity early on is like, let me... Let me gradually apply appropriate stress through plyometrics, through sprinting, through agility, through playing sports, um, through lifting weights when necessary. So uh, that is step number one, build your athletic peak. And then, you know, step number two, like when you get into your early 30s, you got to become really, really smart with how you train. In your 20s, you can be pretty dumb and still get away with stuff. Uh, I just like... There's so many times where I trained really hard, just completely dehydrated, and I was fine. Like, like yeah, may you the studies show like you lose reaction time and you increase your chance of injury and all these things at all ages, but you usually dodge those bullets in your teens and your 20s. And in your 30s, you just don't dodge those bullets. Like injuries happen. You know, it's it's like if I go into a session and I'm dehydrated, I'm peeing yellow. Um, at age 34 and I go start jumping, my knees hurt. Like my knees feel sore. Um, and, and that's a bit like you're not getting enough synovial fluid. We dry out as we age, we lose elasticity. We dry out. Um, it becomes harder to lubricate the joints. Um, we don't have as much water in the fascia. So things just don't slide as well. And so things like nutrition and hydration are now a hundred percent essential for you to even go out and and train hard and, and to make gains from that training session. It's no longer like in your twenties, it's a great idea, but yes, like you could really mess up and still probably get by. You're not optimizing, but you're probably getting by in your thirties. You can no longer get by, right? 
you, you string together a couple sessions where your nutrition was poor, your protein was low, you're dehydrated, you're probably going to create an overuse injury. And you're probably, um, yeah, a lot of times those little overuse injuries is what derails people in their thirties. They get that knee soreness or they get that Achilles tendinopathy. And then they're just like, all right, like I got to shut it down. Achilles tendinopathy might take a year to heal. It might take two years to heal um, in your thirties if you're not doing the right things. And so uh, a lot of times that just derails the rest of their athletic career. Like they, they're just not doing the things to take care of that. Um, they're not hydrating. They're not, their, their nutrition is bad. Their sleep is bad. And then they're just like, all right, I'm in longevity mode. Like I'm just going to do these corrective exercises for the rest of my life. Um, so yeah, uh, nutrition and hydration become essential. Sleep becomes essential. Um, warmups become way more important. I used to not have to warm up at all. I could just get straight to it or I just warm up with the task itself. So if I'm going out to dunk, then I would just start with some net touches and then some backboard touches and then some rim touches, and then I'll get my first dunk and then I'm good to go. Um, now I need longer warmups. Like I got to I got to go open chain. So I'll lay down on the ground. I'll do some knee pumps. So just some knee extensions until I feel a good burn in the quad. And that starts to get that synovial fluid going in the knees and starts to lubricate everything, get some blood flow going in the quads. Um, and then I'll hop up, I'll do like a heels elevated, uh, deep squat. And I'm, I'm continuing to release more synovial fluid. And then I'll drop through with a little bit of speed and then I'll get into my jumping, but it has to be a more gradual ramp up for me. Um, if I just go straight to jumping, usually my knees are a little bit more sore. Um, and I just, I'm just not going to get a good session. I could get through the session. I'm just not going to get a really, really good session if I don't extend that warm up a little bit. Um, sometimes I even get in the sauna before, uh, getting like when you think about heat, especially as you age, um, as we dry out, um, you, you think about like the, the classic example is, um, if you put honey in your hand and then rub your hands together, it's really, really sticky. Your hands don't slide very well, but if you warmed that honey up, right, warm it up for 20 seconds. Now you put it in the hands and Ooh, slides and glides. This is your fascia sliding on the muscle, right? This is, um, what we need for elasticity, for fluid movement. When you don't have that, that's when you feel like really, really tight. It might not be that the muscle is short. It's just things don't slide and glide like they normally should. Um, and so heat is important. So as you age, building up your body temperature through a, lo a, a longer warm up is so important. Having some cardio in your warm ups, we do like nasal breathing cardio in most of our programs, uh, even just for five or 10 minutes. And you should be sweating before you start that workout. Um, sometimes I don't have that kind of time. Like I'll be at the house, I'll be busy, I'm doing stuff and I got 30 minutes. I'll actually, we have a sauna. Um, I'll hop in the sauna or if you're at like LA fitness, boom, hop in the sauna for seven minutes and go through a little mobility routine, put your joints through a full range of motion while you're in the sauna. And then you get through your kind of dynamic warm up, and you get out the sauna and you're already sweating. So a lot of times I'll, if, if I'm short on time, I can only get a 30 minute workout. I can't spend 20 minutes. I can't spend 15 minutes warming up. So I'm going to do like five, seven minutes in the sauna, and then I'll get out with a light sweat. And I've already put my joints through a full range of motion while I was in the sauna. And now I can get into more of the specific um, task that I'm getting into. If I'm sprinting, then I'll start at 25%, 50, 75, 100. If I'm jumping, same thing, 25. 50. So uh, you get the point. When you're younger, you can kind of just use the task itself to warm you up. It's still a good idea to go through a full dynamic warm up, but you don't necessarily have to. Again, you just, you get by. Um, but yeah, at 34, it's really tough to just start jumping. It's really tough to just start sprinting. Um, I think it's a really good idea to either extend your warm up, have a full sweat, or do little tricks like that. Hop in the sauna, get a full sweat, go through your full range of motion there, and then start your workout. The other thing for me is extensive plyos has become more important for me. Um, and, and the reason is it, it fills gaps. 
So you got to keep that spring load on your tendons. Otherwise, in your 30s, you're at high risk for, for ruptures. Uh, that, that's the downside to, to 30s. 30-year-old males especially, that's like prime time for tendon ruptures. And so if you go a couple weeks without exposing your tendons to any spring load and then you just go play basketball and you take a back step, it's just not worth the risk. So if I'm playing three days a week, which I don't have the time to, if I'm playing three days a week, these days I don't do that many other plyos. I might hit a couple max jumps because when you play, you don't get that many max jumps. But the extensives, you know, that 30% to 80% intensity, you get a lot of that when you go play. So if I'm playing, I don't need to do a lot of plyos, but that's where I'm getting my, the spring load on the tendons. Um, but especially as you age, what happens is you get busy with other things. And so now you can't go out and uh, you can't go play. And so now I'm going a, a week or two weeks without playing. Well, now three days a week, I got to sneak in some more extensive plyos. Do some ankle dominant plyos. I do some knee dominant plyos. Um, but it, it's not just the the really intense stuff. You need to accumulate volume so that you can replicate the court, right? Basketball specific strength and conditioning, where you're really mimicking uh, the forces and the stresses and the conditioning elements and all that. We're replicating exact movements that are done in the game. That actually becomes more important for non basketball players. Like that, that, that's kind of, um, that's kind of something that messes with your mind. Basketball specific strength and conditioning matters way more for weekend warriors and, and athletes who aren't currently on a team than it does for athletes who are on a team. If you're on a team, you're probably playing, you're probably getting a lot of extensive plyos. You're getting all the specific movements. You're doing skills training every day. Um, so the weight room becomes more of just like, let's do some general stuff. Let's do stuff that we're not already getting on the court. Um, but like in my case, if I'm going an entire week or two weeks without touching a basketball, I need to do some extensive plyos to replicate the, the loads, the spring loads that my tendons will get when I go back to basketball in two weeks. So I think that's the most important thing that you can be doing for reducing the risk of like tendon ruptures and tendinopathies and that kind of stuff. Um, replicating basketball movements like you know how many how much how good basketball is for your mobility J just watch a stationary ball handling drill if you're like shifting weights the right way you get so much internal rotation external rotation the foot is supinating and pronating like you get your mobility work through proper ball handling drills um and then you don't touch a basketball for two weeks because we're busy we're in our 30s we got more important things to do so now I'm not getting that mobility. Now I'm not putting my joints through those full ranges. So now I need to replicate those positions. I got to think, okay, I, in this split stance, I shift this way. I internally rotate. And so you're, you have to like really replicate exact game positions and work on getting in and out of those positions and then exploding out of those positions. So basketball specific uh, change of direction work, basketball specific agility becomes way, way more important the less you're actually playing. Um, so a lot of people think about that backwards. If you're 20 years old, you're on a college team. When you go to the weight room, everything should be basketball specific, specific angles and specific agility. And yeah, some of that can be good, mostly for filling gaps. Um, but you're already getting a lot of that on the court. But somebody like me who isn't playing enough basketball, I got to replicate basketball specific positions and basketball specific forces and replicate the conditioning demands to then fill those holes so that when I get back to it, I'm not going to get injured and I'm still going to be relatively prepared. Now, there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing in this world that gets you in basketball game shape like playing basketball. Even if you just played one-on-one, -on -one, like you get in pretty good shape, but Basketball game shape five on five is just very different. Getting up and down, the decision making, even if your lungs and your muscles and everything is optimized, like there's 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 just a brain component, like there's brain conditioning, there's competitive stamina. Like how long can I stay locked in defensively? Your mind just starts to wander like uh, uh, the game is moving too fast. So there, there's just so many components of of being in basketball shape that can only be developed through playing five on five basketball. Um, but especially in terms of reducing the risk of injury, I got to get myself to the court healthy. I got to not get hurt when I go play. And so we are trying to fill holes and we're trying to do the best job that we possibly can to 
replicate those stresses and replicate those forces on our body. All right, next question is, how do we balance specificity versus overload? So I made an Instagram post on this recently that there's generally in training, you're going to have a trade-off between specificity and overload. So let's use the weight room as an example. If I'm trying to jump higher off one foot, um, you get specificity from running fast and jumping high off that one foot. There's 0.2 uh, seconds on the ground. It's very quick. There's specific angles. Um, so how do I overload it? it? It's highly specific. So the only way that I can really be specific to that task is to go do it, right? Um, but well, then how do I progressively overload that? Well, the only way you can really do it is to progressively overload volume or hope that you're consistently jumping higher, which means you're applying more force, you're applying more stress. So now if we're like, well, we want to overload it because we want to strengthen that position. I could throw on a weighted vest. I could throw on a 10 pound vest. That is a form of overload. However, you made it less specific because the more weight you have, the slower that ground contact becomes. So you see what I did? I overloaded, but I lost specificity. Now, if I want to take that to the next level, I could go do max strength. Okay. I'm going to go through a similar pattern and I'm going to squat a really heavy weight. Well, now it's even slower. It's even less specific. So it's not that that's bad. You're building general qualities by overloading. Uh, but the more we overload and challenge the body, the less specific we get. So ideally in training, we, we do have a balance of things that are just general. We're just overloading these certain systems and then things that are highly specific. Same thing goes with skills training. So I, I the post that I made was, um, you'll hear people talk about like, all you're gonna do in a game is catch and shoot and catch and attack a closeout. Everything under three dribbles, that's what you do in a game 90% of the time, so that's all you should work on. And they want kids to just work on catching and just ripping through and three dribbles and making a regular layup because that's highly specific to what they do in the game. The problem is there's no overload. There's no system overload. I'm not enhancing anything. There's no, it's too easy of a skill to actually uh, get better in one-on-o training. Now, if I'm working against defense and I'm going one-on-two or I'm in game-specific, I'm doing small-sided games, now there's, there's specificity and there's overload. But one-on-o, just replicating that motion there's no overload, so I'm not enhancing in the system any any actual system, and it's actually fake specificity because there's no decision making component. Um, but that idea of like just keep doing the easy things over and over and over again in training, I can already make ten out of ten. Well, that's not going to get me to the next level. Now, if you got a beginner who's only making five out of ten, then yeah, you're getting some specificity and you're getting some overload because it's still difficult for them to rake, make regular layups. So we don't need to progress to the next level. They're only making five out of 10 layups. Let's keep going on this basic, simple drill for as long as we can until they're making nine out of 10, 10 out of 10 layups. And then you need to add some form of overload. So then in the post I talked about, okay, I was like going full speed, putting it between my legs, behind the backs, fast spin, difficult layup. That's a drill that's not that specific because I wouldn't string together that many moves in a game. However, it challenged my systems. It challenged my proprioception. It challenged my coordination. It challenged my ability to run fast and keep the ball with me. After that spin move, I had to gather myself and focus on the rim and finish. And it's one of those, um, it's one of those drills where if I did it full speed and I actually challenged myself each rep, I'm probably only making seven out of 10 layups, wide open, one on O. So my success rate is, is, is much lower. And so I am being challenged. I am enhancing systems. Uh, but the more I go in that direction of overloading, like, like now at, at some point it becomes, well, you need to do those moves and then you need to ride off on a unicycle balancing and you need to put it around your back and then hit a half court hook shot. Like at some point that's the ultimate overload but there's absolutely zero specificity. So like, what are we getting better better at? Are we training for the circus at some point? Um, so it's always like balancing, like how far do I go in that direction of overload? What percentage of my training do I want to be just like non-specific peer overload um, versus more like game specific reps? 
Um, typically for us, I like a combination of both in one on O training, but I like to get the specificity through playing basketball and through small sided games and through one on one. That's where you work on your more game specific. Like I don't want you to over dribble. I don't want you to use moves that are uh, that that are unnecessary. That's where I want you to be as efficient as possible. Um, but in the one on O training, I'm okay with you doing some some over dribbling. I'm okay with you um, just challenging yourself. I'm okay with you shooting layups that you don't have the ability to shoot because you're stretching your abilities. So it all comes down to just like this balance. And it also just depends who you are, where you're at. Um, a lot of NBA players, you, you got these NBA bigs who just can't drop step and, and make a hook. And they spend all off season doing that specific skill over and over and over and over again. Thousands and thousands of reps. And every year they still don't shoot the baby hook at a higher percentage. And it's like, what's going on? A lot of people assume, oh, you're lazy. You're not working. No, they're doing more drop set baby hooks than anybody else in the world. But they're trying to attack it in terms of specificity. They probably have a system that is lacking. So here's the example that I like to use. Like if I'm, if you can't shoot free throws and, and you're spending all this time working on your form and working on free, your thousand free throws a day, but we're sitting on the couch. I say, hey, pass me the remote and you throw it over my head. You don't have aim. We don't need to worry about specifics of free throws and, and, and form and any of that stuff. No matter how good your form gets, you still don't have aim. So there's a general system issue that needs to be upgraded. So we can actually just overload that general system, right? In the example of somebody who over and over again, they practice drop step hook and they still just can't make it in a game. Well, maybe we should not work on that specific skill. Maybe we should actually challenge. We should overload your systems, your proprioception system. We should overload your ability to like spin really, really fast two times and then hit a hook shot. It's not game specific, but it challenged your proprioception. It challenged your VOR, the, the stabilizer eye muscles where you spin really fast. How fast can I get locked on the rim? So you're overloading that system and then you're increasing your potential. Now, that doesn't automatically get you better at this more simple skill, but it increased that potential. So now when I go in, I get my thousands of repetitions, I have a higher potential. A lot of people, especially in today's game, where they don't grow up playing multiple sports, their general movement bank and their general systems and their proprioception and all these different systems that make great athletes, their, 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 their ceiling is really, really low. So now you go get the specific reps and we get our 10,000 hours of these specific reps and we peak out really, really early on. And if I enhance the general systems through doing, growing up playing multiple sports, or a lot of times what we're doing these days is trying to make up for that. So I'm giving guys a soccer ball and like, okay, just dribble the soccer ball with your feet for the warm up. Like that's our warm up for today. Do some general stuff and, and you can really start to elevate uh, your, your movement bag. Let's, let's call it your movement bank. And then when we do the specific stuff, it can catch up later on. So that is balancing your general and your specific. Your general, we're just trying to overload your systems and stretch your abilities and get better. But if you go too far in that direction, you just end up being good at doing drills and being in the circus. Uh, but as long as you go back and you do the specifics and you work on specific moves and you play small sided games where you're making specific reactions, um, then you can realize that potential. And that's when you really take your game to the next level. So that's a huge focus of the skill code in the unranked uh, basketball academy. I just feel like it's this perfect balance of both where you have your specifics, you have your overload. I think there's there's just too many trainers who go all in on one side. They're like, hey, we're the crazy guys and we just like play tag and do backflips. <laughs> and then you, on the other side, you got the specific guys who are like, no, we don't do any of the, those, those clown drills. Like all we do is rip and attack fake imaginary closeouts and do layups. And it's like, you can find a really, really good balance of general overload and specific training 
um, and be a one-stop shop instead of just specializing in one of these areas, which is fine. Like if you're a trainer who's a consultant and you're like, hey, just come learn some of these methods. This isn't everything. This is just, this is, this is part of the equation. You also need to go to all these other guys. Um, that does make sense if you're more of the consultant, but if you're like the trainer and somebody is spending the off season with you, uh, you're, you're probably going to need to be able to balance the two really, really well. All right, guys, thanks for asking some great questions. Again, check out pjfperformance.com for all of our programs. All right, guys, until next time, I'm out.